Hey folks, welcome to part two of our Hope, Health and Climate series. Uh, congrats for those who uh, were two of two. That's super awesome. We're honored that you joined us for uh, the second part of our series today. And I'm Stephanie Noren, comms for the state of Washington for climate solutions. Super, super excited about our lunchtime hour that we're spending with Rebecca Solnit. So uh, super exciting. And before we get started though, I did want to acknowledge that we're wherever you're calling in from in North America and all over the world, you are on indigenous land. And if you don't know where that is or where you are, uh, we have a resource that you can look that up right now. And ultimately, uh, we just wanna challenge all of our viewers and supporters and folks who follow Climate Solutions, especially for those of us or, or for those of us who are uh, not native to the land that we live on um, and challenge you to just go beyond acknowledging uh, the original settle, uh, the original inhabitants of your land and just knowing that we do and have uh, benefited from settler colonialism and it's up to us um, as in, as those individuals to learn more about what that means and to be accountable to that. And so at Climate Solutions, we have a web page where we've added some uh, more learning and we encourage you to check that out. And that's climatesolutions.org forward slash whose land. And just a quick note uh, that we are live tweeting at Climate Solution today with the hashtag Climate Hope. So you can let us know what you're liking about the show or um, just what you're excited about. Uh, we will send the recording out for both today and yesterday over the weekend. So you can look out uh, for those recordings if you missed yesterday or you've got to log off for, uh, for a meeting uh, midday today, but don't worry, you can uh, catch the recording via email. And I just wanna note for this, because this is a shortened event, we actually are not going to engage with the Q&A as we've done in the past. So we're really just gonna give time for my colleague Kimberly Larson and Rebecca Solnit to chat and really wanna maximize the amount of time for that conversation. So um, for folks who have typically responded, we will not be doing the Q&A. And I think that that is it. I'm gonna get out of the way and turn it over to our speakers. Hey, Stephanie. Hi, Kimberly. Welcome. Good see you. Hey, pretty exciting. Very exciting. <laughs> Super. Well, I am going to exit, stage exit to the left and uh, settle in to listen. Thank you, Stephanie. And so for folks, you know, Stephanie is a colleague of mine who works with Washington as far as uh, all the communications, telling the good stories there. And then I work with our communications and engagement team. And it's just a true honor. Also occasionally get special treats like this. And I felt like a kid in a candy store trying to prepare for this interview because this is just such a treat. Um, Rebecca, really, we're so grateful for your time today. And we're actually wanting to, I wanted folks to know that the intention here is while we have a lot of several questions for Rebecca and what I'm gonna do is some folks are discovering you for the first time today and other folks have known you a really long time and everything in between. Uh, and I wanted to just read some of Rebecca's words for folks to hear um, for some of the just topics we wanted to explore. And so you can hear some of her writing. I'll reference some titles so you can check them out further. Also, though, wanted to bring in some other voices who can't be with us live, but are also fabulous leaders in this space and other spaces as far as the work that they and the goodness they create. So and felt like some of that complemented some of Rebecca's words very nicely. So we'll pull those in. Um, to the cake butter that we're baking up to here today um, of the good stuff um, to talk about. And so that's just some table setting, but I wanted to introduce uh, Rebecca formally. And I'm going to just note if you're for today finding out about climate solutions for the first time, please just go to our website to find out more of our Northwest based work uh, for the clean energy uh, solutions. So Rebecca is a longtime author, 20 plus titles of books, plethora of articles, writes regularly, obviously for The Guardian and a lot of many other outlets. Um, but also, uh, is folks might not know, a public school kid, uh, which I love as a as a kid myself of uh, public schools and want to give that a shout out, but also um, you have led so much in the climate space. And I think that really discovering your work, you're a longtime feminist. Uh, people might know she wrote the book. And if you don't, um, as far as uh, uh, men explain things <laughs> uh, and, uh, and some other things as far as being a true feminist. And then you bring that work and that perspective to your to the climate movement, which is just so valuable. And so being a climate uh, feminist, being uh, an activist yourself, sitting on the board of Oil Change International, people should know, and also recently starting a really incredible new project. We'll make sure to share the links before we end uh, with Not Too Late, 
uh, and it's a really nice new project too. And we'll be uh, tweeting about that. Uh, we have been, and uh, we'll continue to. So to, uh, in the spirit of Orwell in the garden, I wanna dig in uh, to your uh, work and wanted to first read a quick bit on hope. Um, that Rebecca's written for folks to know, and then also another uh, quote from a leader that we're really excited about. Uh, so on hope, you've provided some thoughtful, I think, real clarifications of the definitions of hope. And you've said, when you take on hope, you take on its opposites and its opponents, despair, defeatism, cynicism, pessimism. And I also love that you argue that you take on optimism too. Uh, you have said hope is a gift that you don't need to surrender. It's a power you don't have to throw away. And though hope can be an act of defiance, uh, you, it's defiance isn't enough reason to hope. I love that you said that too. And it's an account really of these complexities and the uncertainties and the openings. Uh, those are all your words and also the broad perspectives, but with specific possibilities. And also that you've noted, it's important to say what hope is not. So you have said that it is uh, not the belief that everything was or is or will be fine. Uh, I wanted to just quote also, uh, when I think about hope, I sometimes also think about prayers, but in a good way. And Reverend Warnock, who just rewon in Georgia, has also said that a vote is kind of a prayer. It's the kind of world, you're voting for the kind of world you want to live in. So with all that as context, I would just love to turn to you and hear like, what uncertainties, uh, openings, or specific possibilities feeds your hope right now? And I what would, prayers can we all offer um, for the world that we want to live in? Yeah, I would say that my sense of hope has always been a sunny version of uncertainty. I included optimism with pessimism, cynicism, and despair, because they all have a kind of certainty. And we all know people who have those orientations who tell us, what's going to happen, what can't happen, what will never happen. And it's uh, always feels like they're choosing themselves over choosing the world because it, it makes you feel strong. It makes you feel bulletproof in a way. And, you know, to assert that, you know, what's going to happen, that you're in control, that you're not going to be fooled um, for all the cynical people who see it as a kind of sophistication. But if there's one thing history shows us is that there are surprises over and over and over again. The day before the Berlin Wall fell, nobody knew it was going to happen and was going to happen the sudden and comprehensive and miraculous way it did. You know, and you go deeper in time and there are things that happen slowly, but that are still astonishing in the long run. Something I say a lot is because the world of 2072 is unimaginable now in 2022. A lot of people think it's impossible. But if, you know, if we had time travel and we were buttonholing people on the street in 1972 to tell them about 2022 in terms of where we were with energy politics, where we were with trans and queer rights and women's rights and rights for people with disabilities, in you know around race and obviously all these things are not fixed and resolved we're not in utopia but the world is so profoundly different in fundamental ways and nobody foresaw and there's lots of science fiction with colonies on mars and jetpacks and aliens and none of it in which the culture changes you know i'm thinking of the classic stuff i grew up on the kind of arthur c clark robert heinlein stuff it does not imagine unless it's ursula k Le Guin, maybe one of the great women of the of the northwest uh you know a world where gender and identity and senses of values are so profoundly changed so hope and uncertainty are not really separate things and hope is maybe an aspect of a recognition of the truth of uncertainty. As for what Reverend Warnock said, I am thrilled to pieces he's won his fifth race in two years. <laughs> I also know that if you'd buttonhold people and said, hey, North and hey, hey, George is gonna elect this Jewish guy and this black guy too super progressive to somebody 10 or 20 or 30 or 50 years ago, they would have been, that could never happen. And uh but I don't think of voting as prayer because I feel like mm -hmm. prayer is asking a higher power for something. You know, it's kind of sending out wishes and feelings, whereas voting is concrete action. If, en if enough of us vote for something, we get it without divine intervention. 
So with all due respect to the Reverend Warnock and who I think is completely wonderful. And I so love that. Why do we have this Senate majority? And it's a bit more bulletproof than it was with 50 senators. Um, and it's really because the man preaching from the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr.'s pulpit shifted the whole nation. And that's kind of magical and beautiful and unforeseeable too. Yeah, that uh, I would love Ashley to then jump to something that you've talked about, what you've referenced it a few times, um, the kind of unseen organizing. Uh, yeah. you've, you've mentioned that. So for uh, those who have not read, there's a beautiful passage in Hope in the Dark that Rebecca's offered about mushrooms, uh, really thinking of, and I actually have my mushroom necklace, necklace on today for you and for the whole spirit of this. It's a little one uh, around my, right by my heart, but uh, because it is that that spirit of like what I think you had said, um, you know, after a rain, the mushrooms appear and what we see on top are just the flowers of a much larger body underneath is what you're like kind of digging into in the, in your book and, and really thinking about the unseen world underneath that underground. Um, and it's really juicy. I encourage folks to, uh, to see it. So I was just curious. Yeah. I don't know if you could unpack more as far as some of that unseen organizing, what, what is happening underground maybe that others aren't aware of right now that might pop up with the reign of opportunity. Um, I mean, there's, there's two pieces to that, one of which is the mushroom metaphor, which is the mushrooms we see sometimes are only a small part of what's there all the time, which is the great underworld of mycelial threads and larger mushrooms of which what we what we call mushrooms are only kind of part of the fruiting body and that's true socially as well one of the things i find incredibly heartening and encouraging is that almost all good positive meaningful change comes from the shadows and the margins and people often don't notice it until the impact is really big and rosa parks was not somebody who decided to sit on a bus seat one day she was somebody who'd been building up to that as an organizer, a champion for rights for people of color for a really long time before that. Usually by the time we see something as activism, as a movement, you know, it's because it, it's been happening for a while. Usually, and I see the world often as being like a theater. There are people who are on stage who have a lot of power and the spotlight is on them which blinds them if you've ever been on stage with lights to what else is out there. And ultimately a powerful idea, whether it's about gender or climate or nonviolence, uh, economic justice, student loan debt, will arrive at center stage, but people will have not acknowledged it until that happens, unless they're also in the shadows, also on the margins. And we've seen so many ideas about indigenousness about you know move from the margins and the shadows from people who weren't being listened to but were vo you know the opposite of voiceless you could call them voiceful and see how uh, how those ideas move so that's part of it and then you know the other part of it is people often think people form a lot of opinions about the future and a lot of those assumptions are the future is just going to be exactly like the present. There's going to be more of something or less of something or something will get better or worse. But we see all the players, like it's a chessboard and we know all the pieces. But what you see over and over is movements that didn't look like something much suddenly seem to appear. And again, if you weren't part of it out of nowhere, if you look at Me Too five years ago, as a woman who writes about feminism a lot, I was always being asked questions for a few years after about like Me Too appearing out of nowhere. And I was like, no, there'd been this incredible feminist resurgence starting in about 2012 and 2017, a lot more people started to pay attention because suddenly there were a lot of movie stars piping up about famous people. And the same, you know, the same goes for climate and so many other things. And Black Lives Matter happened at a certain moment out of a conversation that already existed and that had never not existed for black people and so i think there's off we have to reckon that what will shape the future is things we can see but also things we can't 
and the way that things will change suddenly. For climate, I think we've seen a lot of things become a lot more visible to a lot of people. And I think the climate movement as a whole has had its biggest victory that matters in recent years. I was out walking with my friend Nikayla, who was a principal in uh, the Sunrise Movement until she left, I forget, earlier this year or late last year, I think earlier this year. And we kind of looked at each other and I said, do, do you, does it look like this to you? Does it look like this to you? And what we're talking about is the most important victory the climate movement has to have is to convince the majority of the public that climate change is real, it's urgent, that we have solutions and that we support um, fully funding and acting on those solutions. A few years ago, we didn't have that and now we do. And it's something much less tangible than, uh, you know, a Green New Deal and um, inflation reduction plan, uh, you know, budget plans, etc. But it's even more important because it is the foundation for the scale of climate transformation we need. And there wasn't, they're also speaking of uncertainty and invisibility. There wasn't a moment where it's like, oh, we don't have the public and now we do. It was one of those slow transformative things. And then between, I think, all over the country and the world, all of us seeing or living through climate disasters, fires, floods, storms, hurricanes, heat waves, and the climate movement itself with the input of unforeseeable people like Greta Thunberg really changed the game. And I think Greta is a perfect example because again, if you told somebody, you know, 10 minutes before she sat down to do her first climate strike, like, oh, there's a 15 year old girl on the spectrum who's gonna alone kind of change the whole game for the whole visibility, the whole climate argument, the whole climate activism participation, people would be like, oh, a kid, a kid with a homemade cardboard sign in Sweden, big deal. And she turned out to be a really big deal. And, you know, with a global movement involving a lot of young people in Africa, North America, and other parts of the world, South Asia. So that uncertainty and that energy in the shadows and the margins, it's discounted I think is a lot of where hope lies. You, that reminds me of a part that you have written on story. Uh, when you're talking about these like shadows and margins, and then you've also you know, talked about storytelling and the need to be thinking about stories can be breaking silences. Uh, and I wanted to, for folks, you know, we all, we all, humans are drawn to story, right? We're all like gather around the campfire, the cave art, or, you know, more recently the movie theater, what moves us as far as narratives. And we also try to ground things in narrative constructs to like have people just come deeply understand in their hearts versus just their heads. Um, cause that's really what's to win. So people get excited. Uh, so, but I wanted to ask you on storytelling, uh, our movement talks about a lot about it. Uh, we need to tell more stories. We hear that out in the world also. And you've talked about how liberation is part of the storytelling process. Like I was just saying, you talked to the break silences. Uh, we need to make new stories. You've also said that you recently, just yesterday, I think dashed off like the climate crisis is actually a storytelling crisis. And uh, the last bit I want to just add, and then I turn it to you, is author, and I don't know if folks know, uh, Words to Win by podcast uh, host, uh, Annette Shankar Osario, who's a fabulous just framer of uh, messaging and how to talk about things. And uh, she said, uh, the, go the job of a good message isn't to make what's, uh, isn't to say what's popular, but to make popular what needs to be said. And so I'd love to just hear from you as far as like unpack the storytelling crisis a little bit. <laughs> um, like what needs to be said right now that is not popular, but would help people um, as far as breaking through with that liberation, like you mentioned too, from fossil fuels. Uh, you know, what silences do we need to break and how do we think about that liberation and storytelling? Can you just talk a little bit more about that uh, climate crisis, storytelling crisis, nexus? Uh... With pleasure. I think the first thing to say is that there was a period where people were constantly saying, oh, stories are wonderful, stories are good, we love stories, let's have more stories. And not all stories are good. There are stories about how some people are naturally inferior to other because of their race or gender, 
Uh, there are stories about, you know, there are stories that are prisons and punishments and stories that are damaging, stories that prevent us from um, doing what needs to be done, from being well, from thriving, from connecting to each other. And then there are good stories. And so I think the work that I've tried to do has been as much about breaking stories as making stories. I mean, 30 years ago, when I started writing about Native America in the context of the American West and the environmental movement, there was a story that there were a bunch of stories. First, there was a story where Native people had somehow disappeared, and that was very sad, but it was all over, and we didn't have to think about them or regard them as part of the conversation. There was a, there, a connected story that somehow the natural landscape had been discovered by white men and the language around virgin and discovery and first person ever was used constantly this kind of sexualized virgin landscape language which meant that so much of the mismanagement that comes from fire suppression etc comes from assuming a landscape in which human beings were not did not belong in nature you just dis, you break that story you dismantle it not only does that open space more space to recognize and hear native voices but it also means that we can stop mismanaging the landscape so profoundly by imagining it as something that it never was i meant you know it was never wilderness in the sense it was spoken about it was somebody's homeland so changing stories breaking stories discarding stories as well as making stories is all those things are the job we need to do especially those of us who kind of chose chosen as storytellers. So in the climate movement has been so interesting because it's had different stories it's able to tell. I was thinking about the dismal world of compact fluorescent light bulbs and Priuses, which are really from the, the climate movement, such as it was, you know. <laughs> I have to laugh when you say that's so funny. <laughs> the dismal world is true. The assumption was we didn't really have good alternatives to fossil fuel and you think back to that moment and it's kind of this why it's just so wildly different than where we are now uh, wind and sun were not adequate technologies for us to truly exit the age of fossil fuels as we need and that's an energy revolution because now they are more than adequate that's an energy revolution that's been so slow most people don't see it so we need stories saying we are living through the most amazing revolution maybe human beings have ever had. As Bill McKibben puts it, after 700,000 years of using fire to do all these things, we can do it with the fire that is the sun and not fire on earth, when to not heat the planet, you know, as sun and as the wind caused by temperature differentials. So changing the story is huge, but there's, and so the, the climate movement can now have different stories than it had. And I think we're in a, process where there's two really important stories to wrap up this segment we need to change a really important one is going from a story of austerity and sacrifice and renunciation to a story of abundance the climate crisis particularly by its enemies is constantly framed as though the climate movement wants you all to live austere lives of renunciation what I find fascinating and terrible about that is the assumption that right now we're living the good life and we're rich, but we're poor in hope, we're poor in social connectedness and sociability, where loneliness is such a crisis, we're poor in clean air and clean water, we're poor in solidarity, where, you know, we need to reimagine what wealth is, have stories where your wealth is your friendships, your relatedness, your connectedness, your hopefulness, your sense of living in an ethical and beautiful world and a clean world, your sense of being connected to the natural world by not abusing it. So to change the climate story, which Thelma and I at not too late talk about all the time from poverty to abundance is one of the big uh, pieces that I think we really need to change and tell different stories about. The other piece of it that I think equally the climate movement needs to embrace, we just spent, depending on how old you think the climate movement is, 15 or 20 years or 30 years, if you go back you know, to the very beginning saying, this very bad thing is happening and it will do devastating things. 
I think we've told that story so convincingly that we now have a lot of climate despair, grief, doom, you know, people who really think that it is too late, there's nothing we can do. We need to tell the other story. We have these amazing solutions. Much of the world is still beautiful. The climate movement is powerful. We have a vision of a world in which we do what the climate requires of us. And it's not just a vision of survival. It's a vision of abundance. It's a vision of beauty and joy. It's a vision of a world that could be a lot better than the world we need. And finally, what the climate requires of us is almost inevitably not just making these kind of engineering changes for science on scientific principles, but we do all those and we build a better world because we dismantle the political and literal poisonousness of the fossil fuel industry, the centralization of power that comes with the centralization of control of energy, because sun and wind are pretty much everywhere. And, you know, so there's room, there's a way in which the climate movement, I think, has reached a threshold where we've achieved some really important goals. And now we need to start building new stories and make sure that they reach people. And that's a huge task, but also an incredibly exciting one. Ah. Oh. <laughs> there was a lot that was rich and juicy in there to sink into more uh, if we had more time. I just really appreciate you uh, noting also that challenge of, yeah, changing a light bulb doesn't add up to solving a global problem. So people's critical analysis yeah. of like, you're telling me this thing is going to save the world? <laughs> like if we scale it, maybe like, so we talk about scale. Yeah. Well, that's another that, story that we now understand the fossil fuel industry yes. has really pushed is exactly. to focus on your personal virtue. Yep. When you ask people what they're doing about climate, they'll often talk about their little personal renunciations. I don't drive, I don't fly, I don't eat meat, I do this then that at home etc and it's like personal virtue will not scale up over you know in the rap time span we need we need systemic change which means that we need mass participation to become more powerful than the vested interests the fossil fuel industry the politicians the wall street and bank uh forces funding and supporting all this and that's also part of what we need to change is you know individual virtue is part of the story of individualism that's ultimately the story of alienation and disconnection that doesn't help us as opposed to the story of yeah you know that we have power that we're members of civil society that we belong together that we can change the world um you know and but have to do it as part of something larger than ourselves I want to uh, just flat, we will in just a minute have to wrap, which is so hard to do. Uh, I really appreciate your time. I want to, I'm going to actually just ask a quick answer to this question to then leave time to show the, uh, for folks to see that your website and not too late. Um, just real quick, you have talked a lot about uh, how climate change is a violent act. Uh, you were just talking about the language with like virgin forest, how we have in white <laughs> male dominant societies used imagery um, that often feminizes nature, yet we treat women, especially black, indigenous, you know, trans feminine people, uh, other women of color just uh, suffer from violence and murder at much higher rates. Like we think about how we're trying to, yet Winona Naduke Duke has challenged us all to think about how do we build a society based on honoring the earth. Um, and I'm just... If, I don't know if you had a few examples of, you've talked so much about how we can change words and then we can change laws. We change words and we can change the rules and the outset. Yet our own movement talks about the war against fossil fuels. I don't know if there's a couple of just quick words that you would highlight, um, you know, two or three words that we could shift to as far as thinking about less militaristic terms to build uh, a society honoring the earth versus fighting. Um, we then have to wrap. Um, so yeah. after your answer, I'll just invite my uh, colleague of mine to show the slide with your project too, and not too late and, and wanted to make sure people know about that, so. I think I'd just say in wrapping up that, yeah, I wrote an essay a while ago called Climate Change is Violence because there's been all this silly stuff suggesting, oh, people will become violent if you know, bad climate change happens, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, let's talk about the indirect but profound violence of climate change. And fossil fuel emissions are killing more than 8 million people a year. That's a lot more than any terrorist, 
any violent person than guns in the United States, et cetera. And so, well, there's a famous Woody, Woody Guthrie line, some rob you with a six gun, some with a fountain pen. I think another way we need to change the story is to not forget about the people who get killed with six guns, but to be really clear about the conscious decision to cause death, despair, displacement, uh, environmental destruction made by powerful people in banks and the fossil fuel industry, in governments, et cetera. And to recognize that violence and to recognize it as a form of war, not only against nature, but against the vulnerable human beings on earth and as to delegitimize it as a form of violence. And so that's also a storytelling challenge we face, I think. And, you know, so changing the stories is part of how we're going to win this climate struggle in this decade as to give people better stories that are better because they're both more hopeful and more accurate. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're having to wrap and I wanted to highlight though this new project of yours. I love how you invite both newcomers and folks who might feel crusty with their hearts <laughs> and outlook yeah. uh, who are weary. Uh, Stephanie, welcome back because we're going to turn it back over to you now. I wanted to just highlight your project here um, and really appreciate this time and all you do in the world and love how you're um, all. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Deep gratitude. And welcome back, Stephanie. It's great to see you at the end of this conversation. Hello, Kimberly. Thank you, Rebecca. And this is definitely a way to kick off our, the start of, well, it's a great way to kick off the start of the weekend is um, getting to hang with Rebecca Solnit for uh, our lunch hour. So, and um, just want to thank everyone for tuning in today and for folks who were able to make last night. We just really appreciate uh, your support and interest in our work. There is no greater compliment to us than to see your faces and uh, numbers of folks watching out there. Thanks to all of our speakers, obviously Rebecca Solnit today, but Dr. Leah Stokes, Dr. Vinay Gupta, and Dr. Howard Prumpkin from yesterday. Big thanks to the Climate Students team, our production team, our staff, all the folks who have helped make this uh, two-day series online. Uh, possible. It's a lot of work and I really appreciate all of y'all um, sending all those emails and doing all that stuff to make this happen. Uh, just want to note that today is part of our year end giving uh, month. So we have this month for our fundraising is, uh, campaign is called Hope, Health and Climate. And if you have not had the chance to donate to Climate Solutions, we encourage you to consider a donation today. And you can do that on our website at climatesolutions.org forward slash give. I just wanna make a note that it is year in giving. You're getting a lot of requests, I'm sure, uh, from Giving Tuesday, from around Thanksgiving, through the year end to donate to a wide variety of organizations I'm sure you all participate with. And we just encourage you to give to uh, issues that really matter to you. And if that's climate solutions, that's wonderful. We also have a number of partners and just encourage you, but do encourage you to include climate solutions as part of your uh, year end giving campaign. Uh, we are raising $100,000 this month. And uh, just, yeah, every gift matters. You have monthly options. There's lots of ways to give at Climate Solutions. And you can do that uh, on our website. And ultimately, I think your, your gift helps support our work. It helps us continue to collaborate with our partners, engage with you all on climate policy in Washington and Oregon. And I think we mentioned yesterday, but um, super critical, we have passed some kind of remarkable climate uh, policies that lead the nation in both Washington and Oregon on clean buildings, uh, for clean transportation, for economy-wide emissions reduction in Washington and in Oregon. And so um, we will be turning to implement those policies. And I think um, that just wanting to reiterate that that's just as critical, if not more, to ensure that the laws actually do benefit community, that there's an equitable approach that engages community, um, and that they actually do uh, reduce emissions. So um, that's what we'll be turning our work. And I think just in just a few minutes, I'll be turning it back over to um, a recording from our deputy director, Savita Reddy-Pathy, who will let you know what we're uh, what we're working on in 2023. But before I do, I just want to thank a few folks, our climate protector sponsor, Lisa Adato, our climate leader sponsor, Audi, our virtual table hosts and captains, and then all the sponsors that you're seeing up on your slides right now.
And again, thanks to our speakers, thanks to our board of directors, thanks to our volunteer fundraisers, and just all the folks who help make these events possible. They do take quite a bit of coordination and work from everyone. I'm Savita Redipathy, and I have worked on climate, the biggest justice issue of our lifetimes, for 25 years. Almost 13 of those have been at Climate Solutions, where I've seen that we are undoubtedly helping lead the way on climate action. Climate Solutions is focused on mission critical work at the state and local levels because the progress that we make here has an impact that goes far beyond our region. As you just heard, we're seeing solutions everywhere from government to business to activists and the nonprofit community. Here in Washington and Oregon, the last few years have been a time of incredible progress. We passed groundbreaking policies that have firmly established this region as a national leader in climate policy. Oregon has the clean, uh, strongest clean fuel standard in the country. Washington now has the strongest building codes in the US for new residential and commercial construction. Our region is among a growing number of states legally committed to 100% clean electricity. And our state's leaders passed these policies, not only because they're good ideas, they also did this because people like you called for these changes. Thank you. Nationally, our federal government passed the most consequential climate policy in our history, the Inflation Reduction Act. We just heard from Greg and Dr. Leah Stokes, one of the foremost experts on this. And only yesterday, Portland, Oregon became the first city in the country to phase out petroleum diesel by 2030. Let's keep adding to this momentum of climate action and remember that things that seem impossible truly can happen. We can turn the promise of policies and investments into real progress on the ground, cutting more pollution, creating more good paying jobs and investing in solutions in the hardest hits and historically underinvested communities that bear the brunt of climate injustice. 2023 is Climate Solutions 25th anniversary. It will also be a critical and consequential year to address the climate crisis. There is momentum and hope for truly transformative climate solutions and at the scale that is needed. We know that historic pollution is in our atmosphere and that more impacts in the coming years, if not months, are all but inevitable. Many of us know someone who was at the 18 inning Mariners playoff game. Go Ems in the smoke and 80 degrees in October in Seattle. I do my best to not think about the personal and compounding health impacts of our wildfires. And though the science and trends are overwhelming, it's not too late. You heard from the panelists about what brings them each hope. You all bring me hope. Hope is action. Thank you for facing the climate crisis with us. While the scale of the crisis is huge and the timeline for action is short, Many of the solutions and technology already exist and more investments are coming. A rapid transition is not only feasible, but also is well underway. Shifting away from fossil fuels and towards building new ways to power our economy with clean energy. As President Biden reminded the world last month at COP, good climate policy is good economic policy. What stands in our way is the status quo and overcoming this is the decisive work of our decade. How? By working with Climate Solutions and our partners and the movement we continue to build together. And especially as we start our 25th anniversary next year and carry out our new strategic plan to do four big things. One, pass, implement, and share the success of groundbreaking policies. Two, strengthen collaborative partnerships, deepen storytelling, and align for greater power building. Three, identify and foster innovations across the public and private spectrum in our region, and four, invest in thriving organizational health. As Greg shared, we are in a new era, and the core challenge of this new era is to turn our policy wins into progress on the ground. It's not enough to only pass good laws, we must also make sure that our leaders and agencies implement new policies equitably and inclusively so that people in communities, especially people of color and those who have been first and worst impacted and least responsible for climate change, experience tangible, broadly shared benefits and our states achieve their desired goals. What will success look like as we accelerate the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy across all sectors? Good family wage jobs, buildings where we live, work, play and learn are powered by clean electricity instead of fossil gas. 
everyone having access to affordable electric vehicles and electric mobility options, including public charging, especially in underinvested communities. More homegrown clean energy like wind and solar. Increased and affordable transit options for all, especially for those who rely on them the most. Research and development to accelerate newly emerging technologies. Stories that show that the transition to clean energy is coming soon to everyone's communities and that it's affordable and accessible for all. Real and noticeable health and economic benefits, especially for people of color and low income and rural communities. And clean energy vehicles replacing dirty diesel buses and trucks, especially in communities with the worst air quality. And for my nieces and the kids in your life, electric school buses. Your support will help Climate Solutions implement and protect the policies we've helped pass in Oregon and Washington, like clean fuel standards and 100% clean electricity. Continue to work with partners and connect with all of you to engage on climate action and a just transition collaborate and innovate on new ideas and programs and support and strengthen and grow our amazing team. We need to protect all that we have accomplished and we need to move further and faster on climate action. To paraphrase Lizzo, it's about time. And in the words of MLK Jr., it really is the fierce urgency of now. There is more work to do and we can only do it with all of you. Thank you for giving me hope. Thank you for being here today and for your support of Climate Solutions. We're excited to start our 25th anniversary with you all. Woo, we made it. Great job, everyone. Thanks again for attending and we'll see you around soon. Oh, don't forget, we'll send the recording out in your email and so look for that over the weekend. All right, cheers, bye.